Emeritus of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. Retired from practice in September, I didn't know that. Um, after a 34-year career as a clinician educator of OBGYN and primary care residents at San Francisco General Hospital. And since 2015, he's been a clinical fellow for the National Family Planning and Reproductive Health Association, providing advice on clinical issues and reproductive health policy, and I got his clinical opinion at lunchtime. So Dr. Policar is going to talk to us about contraception and other topics. Dr. Policar. Thank you. Uh, nice, nice to actually be back in this room. It's been quite a while. So uh, thank you for the invitation, and you've heard a little bit about uh, my connection uh, to this issue of uh, family planning and uh, menstrual issues as they come up for women with a variety of disabilities. At our clinic at the San Francisco General Hospital, our Women's Health Center uh, on 5M, we were oftentimes a referral site uh, for women who had a variety of, um, of conditions where they needed a gynecology consult, and uh, we uh, assisted in making the decisions about whether to use hormones or not, an IUD or not, uh, what type, and so on. So that is mainly the perspective that I'm going to bring uh, to you today, as well as um, kind of what's new in the world of family planning so that you can think about how to apply that uh, to your patients. However, before I um, jump in and get started. Whenever I talk about contraception, sometimes when I talk about abnormal bleeding, um, I, I like to, um, to tell you about my bike team. So there are a number of us at the San Francisco General in the OBGYN department uh, who have ridden in the Waves to Wine, which is a fundraiser for multiple sclerosis. We've done that uh, for 10 years. We've raised almost a million dollars uh, in doing that. But I thought you'd be really interested in the name of our bike team. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that is our, the actual back of our jersey. We're, we're, we're pretty well known between here and Santa Rosa, which is, the, which is the termination of the Waves to Wine. Our bike team even has a team motto. We are the best bike team, period. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about family planning. Who, who, uh, you know, most of the folks in the picture are my family planning colleagues at San Francisco General and also talking a lot about bleeding. But before I jump into that, I want to tell you about our go-to guidelines. The Centers for Disease Control uh, over the last decade has developed some incredibly helpful evidence-based guidelines when it comes to family planning. Uh, and there are two in particular that we use every day. And the reason that I tell you about them is that some of the sections in both of these different guidelines have to do with the safety or the efficacy of contraceptive methods in women who have a variety of chronic medical, chronic medical conditions, uh, disabilities, or sometimes both. Uh, the first and most important is called the CDC Medical Eligibility Criteria. Its most recent update was a couple of years ago, and it mainly looks at safety. So tells us about 10 or 11 different uh, categories of contraception, uh, and then 60 different kinds of chronic conditions, uh, and the safety of using a contraceptive uh, for each, a particular contraceptive for each of those conditions. One of the reasons I tell you about it is that I'm going to be using the MEC grading system as we go through uh, three different case studies. But the way that this works is that if it's a MEC category one or two, basically it is safe to use a particular method of contraception for a woman who has a specified disease. If it's a category three, it means that sort of an equal balance of benefit and harms, but Always, it's safer to use the method of contraception than it is to become pregnant. And then the fours are the ones where we avoid a particular method of contraception when a woman has an underlying medical condition just because the risk of the method is more um, uh, it's clearly more harmful uh, than it is for her to use it, sometimes even more than uh, the risk of pregnancy. But you'll see those numbers again uh, in just a moment. The other document that's important is called the Selected Practice Recommendations for Contraceptive Use, originally published in 2013 but updated in 2016. That is much more oriented towards each individual method, about when to start, when to stop, 
uh, specifically how to use the method and then using it in very specific uh, circumstances. So uh, laid out in a slightly different way, but equally uh, helpful. Now, the important thing is that uh, with your tax dollars at work, the CDC actually put together a wonderful app uh, that combines both the medical eligibility criteria and the selected practice recommendations. It's completely free, and the way to get it in the uh, Apple Store or in the Google Play Store, if you have an Android phone, is just to type in the search term CDC and contraception. You can download this, and it's just an incredibly helpful tool to have when you're thinking about what method of contraception might be the most appropriate for your patient. Uh, and uh, I know that our residents at San Francisco General, most of the family planning people that I work with, just constantly refer to this as our evidence-based database about safety and e efficacy of various methods of contraception. So what I've done, and based on the literature, this wasn't entirely my idea, is to put together an algorithm that has to do with two separate issues that we might deal with in women who have developmental disabilities. One is menstrual period and uh, periods rather and irregular menstrual bleeding and how to get that under control. The second is the issue of whether or not that person needs a method of contraception. And then we can basically put together a matrix uh, that puts people in the category of either having bleeding problems or not needing contraception or not. But it looks like this, that it starts with a woman comes in for a visit with her primary care provider or a woman's health visit a family planning clinic or with an OBGYN. We ask about her sexual activity, her menstrual pattern and hygiene. And let's say that she does disclose or her caregiver discloses that she is having problems of menstrual irregularity, maybe very heavy menstrual periods that uh, are problematic for her. The next question is, is she also sexually active? And if the answer is yes, there are specific contraceptive methods that I'll go through with you in more detail that will both reduce her bleeding as well as give her very effective uh, contraception. On the other hand, she may have menstrual problems, but she's not sexually active yet and contraception uh, is not at the forefront. So there's a slightly different list. Uh, and we'll talk about using NSAIDs as a way of getting menstrual bleeding under control. And then some of the other hormonal methods you see would be used less for contraception, but more for um, uh, menstrual cycle uh, control. On the other hand, we have women who are not complaining of menstrual problems, uh, who have regular periods or the amount of bleeding that they have is not problematic for them. If they're sexually active, they can use just about any method of contraception with one or two exceptions that I will cover. For example, using oral contraceptives or patch or ring in a woman who also has a problem of a seizure disorder because of the possibility of interactions with her anti-epileptic medication and the use of uh, pills, patch, or ring. And then the last part of that two-by-two two table is women who don't have menstrual problems and who, who are not sexually active yet. And in that circumstance, of course, none of these hormonal approaches would be appropriate at this time until uh, she discloses that she is interested in becoming sexually active. Now, you may have noticed the asterisk that was present on the question about do you need contraception or not, and, and uh, Eric has done a really nice job of how to have those initial uh, conversations about whether you are sexually active, if not, whether you're thinking about uh, becoming sexually active. So the way we would start in our OBGYN clinic is to assess her capacity to consent to having sex. And if she was having non-consensual intercourse, then of course we would be working with her caregiver and probably going through the process of reporting abuse. But on the other hand, if she was having consensual sexual activity, the kinds of topics that we would be covering would have to do with uh, intimacy and safety issues, physical safety issues uh, with her partner. Number two, whether there's a possibility of having acquired a sexually transmitted infection, screening for that, of course, treating for it if it's needed, as well as providing some amount of education about STD prevention. Uh, Slightly different conversation about choosing a method of contraception uh, for, for many patients. Uh, that is a much more detailed conversation based on shared decision making about 
going through the whole menu of contraceptive methods and asking the question of what are you really looking for in a contraceptive method? Not what method do you want, but what do you want in a method, which is really a much more important question in helping people to decide which method she would like to be able to use. However, the kinds of things that we're certainly going to cover in this discussion is what are the available methods of contraception, the pros and cons of ones that might be most appropriate. Um, of course, the issue of informed consent, whether that can be done by the patient herself or whether there's a, a guardian or a caregiver that would help her with that, and instructions regarding the correct and consistent use of the method, and then always, always agreeing to a follow-up plan so that if she's having bleeding or pain or other problems that we can address that promptly. So let's start with the first of our three patients. She's Jenna. Uh, 19 years old. She was born prematurely at 26 weeks. Uh, she had a birth weight of 1,100 grams. She has both visual and hearing difficulties uh, since childhood, which may have been related to her very low birth weight in the months that she spent in an NICU. She now also has mood problems. She complains of irregular heavy menstrual periods. Dysmenorrhea means that her, pain, her periods are also quite painful and crampy. And Jenna would really like her periods to stop, if at all possible. She is sexually active with a 19-year-old uh, male, and she feels safe and comfortable uh, in that relationship. On physical exam, her body mass ind index, or BMI, is 34. So she's uh, somewhat overweight. Her blood pressure is normal. She has mild facial hirsutism. So when you put together both her body weight as well as her regular periods and her facial hair, you think about the chronic anovulation or polycystic ovary syndrome as a reason for her irregular menstrual periods. So with Jenna, we have two things that we want to address, hopefully at the same time. Number one is to address her complaint about her heavy and irregular periods. And number two, the fact that she's uh, sexually active and wants protection against uh, pregnancy. So here we are in, <coughs> excuse me, in this part of the algorithm where she does have menstrual problems, she is sexually active, and the most appropriate approaches would be a levonorgestrel uh, intrauterine system, or IUD, uh, DMPA, which is Depo-Provera, extended cycle oral contraceptives, or POP, stands for progestin-only uh, birth control pills. Before we actually get to those methods, I want to just uh, preface that with a few other um, just quick remarks, and then, then we'll talk about how we're going to manage uh, Jenna. One is, what are the variety of things that are available to us in terms of helping her with her heavy and irregular periods? And this comes from a really nice clinical practice guideline written by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists a few years ago called Menstrual Manipulation for Adolescents with Physical and, Dis and Developmental Disabilities. I think it's the best guideline written uh, in the U.S. on that particular topic. So they first point out that we can use hormones, sometimes even NSAIDs, as a way of making bleeding uh, less, less frequent, lighter, but it's difficult to actually completely stop menstrual periods. But at least we can make them way less frequent and way less heavy. Number two is that a non-hormonal approach is to use NSAIDs, that they de decrease ovulatory or even, for that matter, anovulatory menstrual bleeding by at least a third. Now, put it into your, into your handout, but I, I knew I'd get a question about, okay, which NSAIDs are you talking about? Uh, and the, the actual go-to NSAID that we use to try to decrease both menstrual bleeding and menstrual cramps is naproxen sodium in a dose between two, 220 and 440 um, BID, twice a day, during the period of menstrual bleeding, that there's good evidence that naproxen sodium actually works significantly better than ibuprofen in women to decrease uh, crampy uh, menstrual periods. But of course, if that's not available as Aleve or one of the over-the-counter over naproxen sodium preparations, then ibuprofen also works not quite as well, uh, but it's got to be given in an intermediate dose of 400 to 600 milligrams three times a day, but only during her menstrual period, only during the time that she's bleeding. She won't need it for the rest of the month uh, in order to anticipate uh, bleeding. And then the ACOG guideline also mentions that we can give oral contraceptives every single day, what's called continuous combined oral contraceptives, over an extended period, and I'll be telling you more about that uh, in a few minutes. Progestin-only pills, which are only one type is available in the United States, but that's one that may go over the counter in the next few years, uh, works well as a method of contraception. The one problem is the fact that it's got to be taken at the same time every day. 
So if a person is in a living situation where they may not be able to have the consistency of a daily pill at the same time every day, then this is a method that might actually eventuate in some amount of breakthrough bleeding. DMPA, you may know that as a Depo-Provera shot that's given every 12 weeks. Um, not only works really well as a method of contraception, but it has a tendency to completely stop periods and induce amenorrhea by the fourth dose. And it very commonly is uh, used for women who have sort of more extreme uh, developmental disabilities where the idea is to try to completely dry up menstrual periods if we can do that. The ACOG guideline also points out that the levonorgestrel IUD, you may know that one by its uh, trade name of Mirena, but there are now four different levonorgestrel IUDs, uh, are also a very, very good choice because they also induce amenorrhea as well as uh, um, being remarkably effective as a method of contraception. Which now brings up the question of efficacy. In the family planning world for the last 10 years, we have thought of efficacy in three tiers. Top tier are the methods that work so well that there's less than one pregnancy per 100 couples per year. And that, those are mainly um, contraceptive implants, one implant that goes under the arm called Nexplanon, any of the IUDs and a tubal occlusion or tubal ligation that we won't discuss uh, today in our patients. Middle tier are the methods that have a failure rate between six and 12 pregnancies per 100 women per year. And those are drugs like Depo-Provera, the pill, the patch, uh, the ring, and the diaphragm. And then the bottom tier, with more than 18 pregnancies per 100 women per year, are barrier methods and natural family planning. So in general, while it's not the sole determinant of the most appropriate method for a woman, if efficacy is really important to her, then of course we'd like to go in the direction of using one of the top tier methods. So for Jenna, here are the sort of pros and cons of each of the methods that are available to her. A levonorgestrel IUS or IUD uh, is tier one efficacy. It works extremely well. Its advantage is that among the various products, uh, there's one that works for three years. Many of them are FDA labeled for five years. The evidence says that they actually work all the way for seven years. So in particular, if a woman, let's say, needs to go to a surgery center to have an IUD inserted, you'd like to choose one that she can use for the longest period of time. And even though Mirena, Liletta, some of the others are labeled for five years, we know that they work for at least seven, probably even longer. As well as stopping menstrual periods, they also decrease pain of menstrual periods, dysmenorrhea as well. The disadvantage is that there are some women with developmental problems who may not tolerate insertion of the IUD in an outpatient clinic. I'm gonna give some ideas about how that could be done, but if not, it's much better, I think, to do it, do it under conscious sedation, either in a special clinic or in a surgery center. And as well, there might initially be some breakthrough bleeding. It has a tendency to clear up fairly quickly. Next is DMPA or Depo-Provera. It doesn't work quite as well as IUDs. Um, its advantages are one shot every 12 weeks, so that means only four times a year, basically a little over four times a year. Great job of reducing bleeding and uh, pain of menstrual periods, but one of the things you may have heard about it is that it can cause weight gain, particularly in adolescence. So if weight gain is an issue, maybe for someone who's already on the obese side like Jenna, uh, that might not be the best approach. Next is extended oral contraceptives, and what that refers to is Remember that birth control pill packs are 21 days of hormones and then seven days of a hormone-free interval, seven days off, during which time you'll have your menstrual period. But extended OCs means using an active pill every single day. One approach is to do that for 84 days in a row and then have a seven-day menstrual period. That means you'll have four periods a year. Another approach is one pill a day, every single day, all year. Just no break, basically, and therefore no periods. That works really well for contraception and really well for uh, menstrual suppression as long as you can remember to take your pill every day. And with progestin-only pills, I would say that that's not as good a choice because number one, it's tier two in efficacy um, and it has somewhat more breakthrough bleeding. It's important to remember to take it every day at exactly the same time. But one of its advantages is that it has no estrogen-related side effects. So there are some women who would like to use the pill, patch, or ring, but maybe because they've had a DVT or a pulmonary embolism or 
uh, they don't like estrogenic side effects, that they can use one of these methods that has progestin only and then not have to deal with the side effects of something which is estrogenic. So the bottom line is that for Jenna, we have quite a number of alternatives for her, both for contraception and to get her bleeding under control. And I think most OBGYNs would tell you that the ideal approach for her, from our point of view, of course, it's ultimately her decision, it would be a levonorgestrel IUD because of its efficacy in inducing either light menstrual periods, which are hypomenorrhea or amenorrhea. They work remarkably well, and it takes virtually no um, input from the patient herself once the IUD is in place. It's what's called forgettable contraception. So you have the IUD inserted or the implant um, put in, and then you simply don't have to worry about your birth control method for the next anywhere between three years and uh, seven years. The challenges, of course, as I said, are a woman's ability to tolerate a pelvic exam in the outpatient clinic, if not needing to go to a, um, a place where she can have conscious sedation to have that done, uh, and uh, not only the exam, but then the procedure itself of putting it in. So I added a few slides about the wisdom that we've learned from a variety of sources and uh, ACOG and others about the pelvic exam itself in women who have a variety of disabilities. And this one is something that I'm sure all of you live every day. We need some reminders sometimes uh, in the world of women's healthcare that the women, woman herself is the one who entirely guides the exam. And what we have to do first is to ask her how she wants to be examined, what position works best. Uh, uh, do you have any suggestions for how we do this? And of course, for me, it's not only true as it relates to, let's say, do, doing an IUD insertion, but I do a lot of colposcopy for women who have abnormal pap smears. And significant women, the number of women who are referred to us are, let's say, for example, uh, in a wheelchair. And so always my first question is, what works best for you in terms of how we can transfer you to the exam table? What's worked best for you when you have a speculum inserted in your vagina so that we can have a look with a colposcope, for example? It's, it's virtually never our decision as clinicians. 98% of the time, the patient can tell us what's worked, what hasn't, and then we follow her instructions. So it's a matter of ask, ask, ask uh, in advance. And she has control. Uh, can you lift the sheet so that I can start the exam? Asking permission before each step in the exam, especially for someone who's had sexual trauma in the past. Always lift the table up so that she can see what's going on instead of being supine or flat on the table. We offer our patients a mirror so she can look at her vulva if she'd like to, and then bearing down with the insertion of the speculum. So there are all the many tricks that we can do to help with the exam. Then another part of that is a very thorough inspection on the outside because of the possibility of sexual abuse or self-mutilation. By the outside, of course, I'm talking about on the initial inspection of the vulva and then remembering about temperature instability in some people and trying to keep the war room warm and offering um, a blanket to be able to keep her warm. Now, I mentioned that with Jenna, she had some problems since childhood with both vision um, and with hearing. So there are some things that we specifically try to do in our clinic with uh, patients who are uh, vision impaired, and that's particularly important in terms of uh, where the helper, uh, whether that's a medical assistant or someone that she has brought with her, uh, will be to be able to sort of explain to her, close to her ear, to her ear, what's going on. We offer the opportunity of feeling the speculum in advance and, of course, being very clear about what we're doing uh, step by step. And for the hearing impaired patient, we want to know where her um, interpreter, if she needs someone to help with uh, signing, uh, will sit. Usually it's sort of a triangle between the clinician who's at the end of the exam table, the person who's doing the sign language, and the patient herself. But you can see in this graphic about the fact that she's sitting up, which is a really important part of being able to do this exam. And by the way, it does not impair your ability to do a speculum exam um, at all. Um, all right, now the last part of it then is, are there any things that you can do to kind of help patients with the discomfort that they may have, especially f in the uh, circumstances that Erica was talking about a moment ago, where someone may be hypersensitive uh, to pain, just the, l the le least amount of touch is enough to, uh, to, 
to feel uh, painful. So we use a lot of what's called verbicane. I'll tell you more about verbicane in just a second. It just means talking with people through their procedure, oops, and distraction. Uh, moving slowly, sometimes using a local anesthetic at the tenaculum site or doing a cervical block. Occasionally we'll do oral sedation in the office, but when we think that the patient's not going to be able to tolerate that very well, we'll use conscious sedation in a, a surgery center. Uh, and then there's some controversies, particularly with IUDs, about whether or not pre-medication works. NSAIDs probably don't help very much with the procedure, although they help with the cramping afterwards. Uh, and there's a medication called mesoprostol. Uh, you may know of it as uh, Cytotec, which dilates the cervix and softens it. That's mainly in women who are pregnant. And in non-pregnant women, it doesn't seem to help as much. And there are six different studies that look at it. Um, as a way of helping with IUD insertions, it doesn't increase the success rate. It doesn't make the pain any less, so we don't use it uh, for that purpose. But verbicane's important. Keep her talking, calm, soothing vocal tone, a slow, easy pace. I'll talk to her about how are the warriors doing? Tell me about where you live, um, the weather, just a variety of things that help, and we love cell phones. And what I mean by that is if I've got a patient who's having a colposcopy or having an IUD inserted and she's texting on her cell phone, I could not be happier. <laughs> and just because of the fact that it is a great form of distraction, and of course I'll tell her what's going on, but um, that, that's a way of self-medication and, and it usually will work very well. Now just to finish up with Jenna, Jenna decided to have an IUD placed, but she missed her appointment. So she called and stated that she had unprotected sex with her boyfriend two days ago and didn't use a method of contraception. And she asked about the morning after pill. And this obviously may come up in other circumstances where one of your clients uh, has um, ho hopefully consensual sex but wasn't protected and asks you about uh, emergency contraception. So there are two different kinds of emergency contraceptive pills that I will tell you about, and we can also use a copper IUD, which is actually the mo by far and away the most effective approach to emergency contraception. So the one that's been out for the longest time uh, is a levonorgestrel emergency contraceptive pill. It is a single dose tablet. You may have heard it referred to as Plan B. It's supposed to be used within three days of unprotected intercourse. And it works reasonably well as long as you give it within three days. You can actually use it all the way out to five days, but there's kind of a drop off between 72 hours and 120 hours. And as I mentioned, uh, Plan B is the generic, I'm sorry, the brand name version. There are many, many generic versions that are available uh, in pharmacies now. And you may have heard, remembered the two tablet versions of Plan B or even using birth control pills as emergency contraception, those are now considered to be completely out of date. It's just a single tablet. The other form of emergency contraception is called Ulipristal acetate, UPA. So it prevents ovulation even right before that egg is, is uh, ready to, uh, to leave the ovary. And it prevents implantation of a fertilized egg, although a much higher dose of ulipristol is required. It's taken as a single 30 milligram dose, and it's labeled all the way up to five days from the day of unprotected intercourse. And there's a single product out there called Ella, and it has to be uh, prescribed. And I've already mentioned that a copper IUD can be used within five days of unprotected intercourse. Uh, it is an off-label use, but widely performed. And it's a very cost-effective approach for the person who needs both emergency contraception and then a longer-term method of contraception as well. And it works for a full 10 years according to the package labeling. It actually works longer than that, probably out to 12 years. Now, an important question is how can your patient um, get, get a uh, supply of emergency contraceptives? And the answer is, is that with levonorgestrel pills, they've been available over the counter for years. There are no age restrictions. Men and women can buy them. A person doesn't need to show an ID that has anything to do with their age. They, the uh, price range is anywhere between $40 and $50. Um, on the other hand, ulipristal acetate or ELLA does require a prescription. Uh, the good news is, is that as part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, women who have Medicaid, who have commercial insurance, are entitled to 18 different methods of contraception, including emergency contraceptive pills without any cost sharing. Thing is, is that in order for the health plan or Medi-Cal to pay for the emergency contraceptive pills, 
either type, a prescription has to be written. That's mainly for bookkeeping purposes. But there are no out-of-pocket costs for emergency contraception as long as uh, uh, you're, uh, you're able to have a prescription for it. If you just buy it over the counter, then it may be that your health plan won't, won't pay for it uh, in that uh, circumstance. One last thing to mention about emergency contraception, and we'll go to our next patient, is there is a relationship between a person's body weight and the likelihood that the emergency contraception will fail. So remember with Jenna, her BMI was over 30, okay? So basically this algorithm is a patient asks for emergency contraception. And we counsel her about whether or not she'd be interested in a copper IUD. If she's not, then the next question is what's her BMI, her body mass index. If she's um, got a BMI of under 35, any of the emergency contraceptive options are uh, ep both acceptable and efficacious. If she's a little overweight, which is a BMI of 26 to 29, the levonorgestrel is less effective than the ulipristal acetate. For a BMI of 30 to 34, there's no question that the levonorgestrel doesn't work nearly as well as ulipristal, and many of us feel that it shouldn't even be used in a person who has a BMI of over 30. I would be way more in favor of using ulipristol with Jenna than I would be using uh, levonorgestrel as, because of her body weight and the likelihood of failure. And then for women who have a BMI of over 35, neither of them work. Uh, and in that circumstance, you really have to use a copper IUD if you uh, want to do emergency contraception because its efficacy has no relationship at all uh, to weight. All right, well, that's what we'll do for Jenna. The next patient is Paula. So she's a 24-year-old woman who uh, has, uh, um, has autism, I'm sorry, autism spectrum disorder. She's virginal. She has no interest in sexual activity. But she does have unpredictable menses and an aversion to changing her menstrual pads. And she doesn't even want to try tampon use, uh, given the fact that she's never had intercourse. She's not comfortable putting a tampon in. She's not had a first pelvic exam. Her BMI is 22. Her blood pressure is normal. And now we have two challenges in regard to Paula. Number one, uh, she's really interested in her menstrual period stopping, um, doesn't need birth control. And the question comes up for this 24-year-old virginal woman, does she need to have a pelvic exam in order to have her first pap smear, her first cervical cytology? So she fits in this part of the algorithm where she does have menstrual problems, she's not sexually active, and these are our four choices, some of which we've already talked about. So NSAIDs by themselves will decrease her flow and her pain. The only side effect are some of the GI issues of stomach irritation that come up with NSAIDs. So that may be all she needs, basically. A levonorgestrel IUD can potentially make her entirely amenorrheic, but again, we've got issues regarding placement. Depo-Provera will do the same thing, and we're not so worried about weight gain in her circumstance because she's slender already. But that's another alternative in terms of completely stopping her periods. Or again, she can go with extended, continuous oral contraceptive use um, every day as a way of, of um, stopping her menstrual bleeding. So any of those are reasonable choices for her. But in her circumstance, given the fact that she's virginal, has an aversion to having um, uh, anything like put into her vagina, maybe isn't ready for her first pelvic exam, I think in her circumstance, probably the optimal approach is um, continuous extended oral contraceptives. And in that circumstance, there's simply no reason to, ex to insist that she have a pelvic exam performed because it will give quite effective uh, suppression of her menstruation if she's able to take a pill every day. Um, it's more forgiving of a missed pill than cycling, which means that if she did need it for birth control, when you're taking a pill every single day and then miss it for a day or two, you're unlikely to ovulate. Consistent um, everyday pill taking may be relatively easy or hard depending on uh, her circumstances. No need for a pelvic examination, but her challenges will be to remember to take a pill every single day. Initially, acceptance of breakthrough bleeding, which happens usually for the first uh, month or two of continuous birth control pills. And then sometimes there are problems with getting a health plan, even Medi-Cal, to pay for a whole year, 16 cycles basically, of oral contraceptives. They're very used to paying for 13 cycles. They sometimes balk at the extra three. And the way to get around that is really easy. You write a Medi-Cal tar, and say, I need continuous birth control pills for this patient, 
and I need 16 cycles a year, and the Medi-Cal TAR field office will almost always say yes, as long as you explain why you need it in that circumstance. Now, one last thing to mention about her circumstance is, does she need to have a first pap smear? So let me just take a sidebar for a second and talk about cancer screening um, in women who have developmental disabilities. And the first one is specifically related to cytology. The, what I'm going to tell you about breast cancer screening and ovarian cancer screening relates to everyone. So in virginal women, and that's defined as a woman who's never had penetrative vaginal intercourse, the risk of dysplasia, which is a precursor to cervical cancer, is extremely low, but it's not zero. So if you compare that to women who have had heterosexual contact or who have had sex with women, uh, where, the, where the risk is probably somewhat less, in women who have never had penetrative sex, we've known for 500 years that their risk of cervical cancer is very low. But it can still happen. It's just extremely rare uh, in that circumstance. Okay. Now, most, I'm sorry, that's missing a G there. It should say most recent guidelines are silent on whether or not virginal women should have a cervical cytology or not. There was an ACOG guideline that was published in 2010 that said that for women who are virginal, irrespective of their age, we should talk about the pros and cons of screening and leave the decision to them as a, as a shared decision. What I usually tell virginal patients is that Again, your risk of cancer is, cervical cancer is really low. It's not zero. It's perfectly reasonable if you do want a cervical cytology, but if you want to postpone that until you start sexual activity, that is absolutely as, as reasonable a choice. And the guidelines would say that uh, as well. Oops, wrong direction. Next question is what about breast cancer screening? Now, this is an area of great controversy at the moment, but basically the American Cancer Society says that clinical breast exam is not recommended for women of any age. If a woman comes in for a well woman visit, disabled or not, ACS is saying there's no evidence to support doing a screening breast exam for those women. I think they got it exactly right. Even ACOG is now saying that that should be a shared decision about whether or not a woman decides that she wants to have a breast exam done or not. Now, this, of course, is a screening exam, not a diagnostic exam if you have breast pain or a breast lump, um, that sort of thing. And then the mammography guidelines, of course, are the same um, for all women. Uh, all the guidelines say basically start at 50, but that women between 40 and 49 uh, should be given information about the pros and cons and be able to make their own choice. Finally, what about ovarian cancer screening? And there's quite a vigorous debate out there about the value of screening pelvic exams. We are unquestionably going in the direction of abandoning the screening pelvic exam in women who have no symptoms, in women of any age, that it almost certainly does more harm than good it's uncomfortable, there are way too many false positives, and it doesn't change any outcomes at all. So if someone were to say, okay, well, our patient doesn't need a pap smear, but doesn't she need a bimanual exam to screen for ovarian cancer or a fibroid or something else? The answer to that is no. Whether she's disabled or, or not, the, um, the guidelines are now almost in, in uniform agreement about the fact that a, a screening pelvic exam is unnecessary and probably does more harm than good. All right, in our last patient then, we'll talk about Elizabeth. She is 28 years of age. She has a history of cerebral palsy. Sorry about the term wheelchair bound. She needs a wheelchair, she uses a wheelchair. Uh, but she also has an issue with epilepsy and that is controlled with carbamazepine, which is an anti-seizure medication. She's sexually active with one partner. She wants to use oral contraceptives, but she's open to using other methods. And here are the challenges that we have with Elizabeth. Can she use oral contraceptives, given the fact that she uses a anti-seizure drug which, is in, which induces hepatic enzymes that would make birth control pills less effective? Number two, does she need a pelvic exam? Um, no. Number three is, uh, how can we do an IUD insertion in a woman who needs a wheelchair? Are there any special sort of, of accommodations that we need to make in that circumstance? So this is the third and the last of the pathways that I'll refer to. So uh, she does not have menstrual problems. She is sexually active. And therefore, we have a whole variety of contraceptive methods that are, are available to her, most of which you've heard about um, already. So in going through that list, the tier one efficacy, the ones that will work the best for her, 
are a copper IUD. We haven't talked about those much so far except for emergency contraception. They work for at least 10 years, probably closer to 12 years. Um, but the one thing they do is they do not make periods lighter. If anything, they make periods a little heavier. Um, not in everyone, but at least in some patients who use them. The levonorgestrel IUD we've already talked about, that would be a reasonable choice, as well as a contraceptive implant, which is a single rod that goes uh, under the skin of the upper arm, and it works for three years, although it, there may be some um, unpredictable breakthrough bleeding which is associated with it. It is the single most effective reversible contraceptive that we have. In addition, we've already discussed uh, DMPA or Depo-Provera. She could use the contraceptive patch. I did not include the contraceptive vaginal ring because it might be a little difficult for her to put in the ring and take it out. Not always, but that's a possibility. She could use extended oral contraceptives or she could use uh, progestin-only pills, um, which might be preferred because of the fact uh, that they uh, lack estrogen. But what I wanna finish up with is this discussion because about the interaction of um, anti-epileptic drugs uh, or anti-seizure drugs and um, hormonal contraceptives. Because I know many of your patients are not only using those medications for seizures, but they might be using them for a variety of other things. Oftentimes, uh, psychiatrists think of them as mood stabilizers, and so they're used with other uh, medications as well. So when we have to make decisions about contraception in women who have seizure disorders, our goals are, number one, to make sure that we're working with the primary care provider or the neurologist to make sure that the seizures are under control. Number two, we want to make sure that she's using highly effective contraception because if she has an unintended pregnancy, in utero exposure to some of those anti-seizure drugs is problematic because some of them are actually teratogenic. Not mildly so, but they're nonetheless teratogenic. And then we want to minimize this interaction between anti-epileptic drugs and contraceptives. And they do that, by the way, um, by the anti-epileptic drug inducing cytochrome P450 in the liver. When that happens, estrogen is chewed up much more quickly. The estrogen levels drop by half, and the method doesn't work as well because of the lower blood levels of both estrogen and progestin. So here is a listing of the various anti-epileptic drugs that are a problem with enzyme induction that may make hormonal contraceptives less effective. I won't read them to you, but I've indicated in red the ones that are sort of the worst actors in terms of making contraceptives less effective. On the other hand, there are an equal number of anti-seizure medications that do not induce hepatic enzymes, and none of these are problematic. That's why it's a thumbs up, because none of these will have any interaction at all with hormonal contraceptives. Okay, so how, how do we manage that circumstance? Elizabeth wants to use birth control pills. Um, she may be a very, very good candidate for that. I'm not so worried about the fact that she needs a wheelchair. I'm more concerned about the issue of the interaction with the carbamazepine. So her ideal contraceptives would either be either of the IUDs DMPA is an excellent choice for women who have seizure disorders because it not only works really well and you only have to be re-injected every 12 weeks, it actually has a calming effect on the CNS and it raises the seizure threshold. So women who have seizures, a seizure problem, are actually less likely to experience them if they use um, DMPA as their method of contraception. Uh, Elizabeth can use birth control pills. We just need to use a higher dose. So we would use at least a 35 microgram estrogen birth control pill. And instead of 21 days on, um, seven days off, we would choose either continuous uh, birth control pills or what's called 24-4, which is 24 days on and four days off, which allows a menstrual period if Elizabeth wants to do that. And then if you're on any of those enzyme-inducing anti-seizure drugs, we try to stay away from the contraceptive patch or progestin-only pills because of the fact that um, the effect of the, an the anti-seizure medication on progestins may drop the blood levels of progestin to the point where they're not going to be effective uh, any longer. One last thing, let's assume that uh, uh, Elizabeth changes her mind. Now she's interested in having uh, an IUD inserted, as we talked about earlier. So the kinds of things that we think about in women's health care, this actually comes from a slide set from ACOG, uh, and you all are expert, and I really don't have to remind you about this, but um, 
any women's health care practice or family planning clinic has to be prepared to be able to help uh, women with transfers. Uh, ideally, that's going to happen in, the, in, in a context where you have an electric table. San Francisco General, probably half of our tables are electric in our clinic. Uh, and of course, we insist on using those in any case where we're going to need to do a wheelchair, wheelchair transfer. We try really hard not to do any kind of physical exam in a wheelchair, including a breast exam unless the patient insists, you know, I can't, I won't, it's not a good time for me to do this, and then we'll do our, our best to try to examine a person in a wheelchair. That's really tough, really suboptimal. It's much safer uh, to try to do a transfer and, you, and you'll have a much more effective uh, exam in that circumstance. Have the patient empty her bladder first and then get away from the stirrups. They usually do not help. The alternative positions are much more effective and so, the kinds of things that I would think about doing are to put in a speculum in a side lying knee chest position, which actually will give you a very, very good view of the cervix uh, without having to put a woman in stirrups. You literally put the speculum upside down. Uh, and it's not particularly uncomfortable, but it gives you an equally good view, particularly if you have a person uh, who's in a lateral decubitus position. What can really help is to have a medical assistant uh, hold one leg up, or sometimes the, the patient can hold her own leg up with her arms. If you can't do that, then an assistant, of course, uh, has to help uh, with uh, being able to do that. Another thing that we do in some circumstances is to move the patient all the way down to the end of the table and do what's called the diamond uh, position. And as long as her bottom is off the edge of the table, it allows a speculum examination without the discomfort of having to use uh, stirrups uh, in that circumstance. And Elizabeth might do perfectly well with her IUD insertion with one of these uh, alternative um, positionings. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop. This is, this is the sleeve of our jersey. And uh, the little uterus and a few drops of menstrual blood coming out, but thanks very much for your attention.